This is Heart Rhythm TV. I'm Roderick Tung. I'm joined today by Stacy Howell from UCSF. And congratulations on your selected paper, Temporal and Geographic Trends in Women Operators of EP Procedures in the US. Welcome to Heart Rhythm TV, Stacy. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here and to have our um, paper uh, featured. So it's featured in a, a lot of different platforms. And this is a really topical area because we understand that there's a lot of gender disparities, socioeconomic disparities in healthcare. But then to really examine this amongst healthcare providers within the field that we hold sacred and we love is really important to highlight that how to, and what extent we're underrepresenting. So tell us a little bit about the work and the mentorship that you had from Bob Nazar. I know you were before at Oregon and how that continued and now you're currently at UCSF. Um, absolutely. So this um, paper and um, the motivation for this study uh, really came, number one, for me as being a woman and a trainee in electrophysiology and new to the field um, is oftentimes helpful to have um, a more critical eye or a fresh set of eyes to uh, realize, you know, there are few women in, in electrophysiology, which we know. Um, the existing data suggests that there's 9% uh, of EP trainees are women um, and roughly 12% of board certified electrophysiologists are women. Um, so being a new trainee in this field, um, I was curious, you know, has this proportion of, of women in EP, is, is that improving over the most recent years? Are we seeing improvements? Um, especially as you mentioned, um, the topic of, of women in cardiology as a whole has has, has garnered um, more importance and a higher platform in recent years. Um, really enjoyed working with the group and all of us have kind of different points of interest on this topic. Um, and overall, I think incredibly important to highlight um, an issue in our field and one in which I hope over the course of my career, we can see um, some improvements in. So tell us a little bit about the data set that this beautiful conglomerate use. This mm -hmm. is the Medicare database, about seven years worth yes. of records so, of cases. Mm -hmm. We used, it's the Medicare Provider Utilization and Payment Database. Um, so this is a publicly available database and uh, it includes all of the procedures and services and drugs that are provided to Medicare beneficiaries. Um, so I, I want to emphasize that, that this is a study looking at Medicare procedures, um, and so it's not looking at, at, at all procedures in the United States, but it is restricted um, to those procedures uh, provided to Medicare patients. Uh, and we extracted data from the database for the most common EP procedures. So that included atrial fibrillation ablation, uh, supraventricular tachycardia and flutter ablation, um, and device implantation. And we uh, took the procedures performed between 2013 and 2019. Uh, so a seven year study period. And then we compared the proportion of women operators um, over that time period. Uh, and the other thing I would like to highlight is that the database excludes operators uh, who perform less than or equal to 10 procedures per year for any individual procedure code. Um, so that's in, important to recognize that the, the data is essentially excluding um, low volume operators. And for that particular reason, um, we did not include ventricular arrhythmia ablations uh, in our study, um, since the vast majority of operators uh, were not captured in the database. Beautiful. So there is a huge data set there. We know there's underrepresentation, and I think the numbers that are coming out of this when I read it and poured over the first time are pretty striking. Why don't you give us some of those bullet points of some of those striking statistics that you found? Um, absolutely. So we found that on an annual basis, uh, on average, there were 5% women EP operators uh, from 2013 to 2019. Um, and when you take that in the context of the total number of EP operators, which was roughly 3,500 total EP operators, that means that there is uh, less than 200 women EP operators on an annual basis in the United States. Um, that number was 187. So it is a very small and um, intimate group. Uh, when we looked 
at each individual procedure uh, type, um, that percentage of women um, was constant throughout. So for AFib ablation, SVT flutter, and device implantation, um, there was on average 5% of women. Um, particularly for AFib ablation, uh, the total number of EP operators was around um, 1,500. So it's a smaller group of people are performing AFib ablations. And what that means is that there was uh, just below 50 women AFib operators in the country. Um, so I, you know, similarly knew that there's few women in our field, but when you actually look at the numbers, it, it is striking um, and you realize uh, that there's few women um, across the country who, who are electrophysiologists. Um, and I'd, I'd also like to mention that for AFib ablation, uh, we saw that there was an increase in the total number of AFib ablationists over the seven year period. Um, however, the pr um, pr proportion of women operators um, remained constant and did not in, um, increase despite the total number of operators increasing. So, um, you know, it, I guess in summary, we found that women are grossly underrepresented as EP operators, and they're unfortunately the trend has been stagnant um, from 2013 to 2019. Very important data here. And then the other really striking statistic um, was that in about 20% of states, there are no female operators that do more than 10 cases, which you defined as kind of medium or moderate volume? Right, so uh, for device um, implantation was a really, as one may expect, um, had the, the best representation of women in terms of geographic location. Um, and there, the, even, even in that case, there were 10 states or 20% of states did not have a woman um, implanting devices in the country. And then for both AFib ablation and for SVT and flutter ablations, uh, that's where we saw 20 states um, or roughly 40% of states who had no women um, performing uh, those ablations. And you contrast that um, with men, that there were zero states who had no men operators for device implantation, and there was only two or three states um, who had no men um, doing AFib or SVT or flutter ablations. So there really, is- It's really astounding to think that you could be in a state and be one of the first female EPs. That's how new this is and how much disparity there is at this day and age, and really be one amongst millions. Um, to be able it to serve, incredible. Whole, serve a whole state. So let's talk a little bit about why and let's talk about what we can do as a society and what we can do within the field to change this. Because I, we've dedicated our lives to EP. EP is one of the most beautiful fields and that's heavily biased. But there's no reason that I believe that that passion for EP or the beauty for this field should be any different in terms of appealing to men and women, in particular, you cite in the discussion that 8% of general of in, interventional cardiologists are women, and EPs losing to interventional cardiology, which has STEMI call, which has more x-ray potentially because we're doing floralist procedures. So what would you believe are the top reasons that are deterrents for women? And how do you change this cycle as a young, new rising star in EP? How do you change that for young internal medicine residents coming up that you rotate with and uh, young female general cardiology fellows? I think those are great questions. Um, some possible, I think, explanations and um, potential solutions. And it is particularly helpful, I think, to compare and contrast with interventional since you know, one would think we're all coming from cardiology and there should be some shared interests there. Um, a few things come to mind. I think one is increasing the recruitment of women into EP. And part of that may be exposure. Um, you know, as general cardiology fellows, we all rotate and we have, I think, relatively, you know, a fair amount of hands-on experience um, in the cath lab. Um, but oftentimes, I, I think in electrophysiology, it, it may be harder for your general cardiology fellows to get the same exposure um, since you know, the, the concepts are, are different. You're, you're really not building on the same knowledge base as a general, as within general cardiology and you're learning um, really 
unique and, and different concepts. So I, I think on one hand, perhaps all of us can make a, a better effort to um, engage our general cardiology trainees um, in the EP lab with hands-on experience um, and make it a, um, a little bit more accessible. Um, I think is, is one is one consideration. I think um, secondly, and this is a broad issue for cardiology as a whole, but I think particularly is um, perhaps maybe worse in electrophysiology is um, issues relating to um, family leave um, and concerns about um, family planning as an example. So um, there was a recent study that had come out highlighting that within women cardiologists that um, a, a large proportion of them um, did not have paid maternity leave and the duration of that leave, leave was um, pretty variable. And so I think that impacts any uh, cardiac proceduralist and perhaps that's a large deterrent um, to women joining electrophysiology. Um, and then lastly, the duration of training, as we know, is, is quite long um, and it is longer than interventional cardiology. And so that may have a bearing as well. Um, so, you know, those are three issues that come to mind as possible explanations as um, and, and avenues for hopefully solutions in the future, um, because we do want to have the the most talented um, trainees join our field. And I, I think more women um, would probably enjoy electrophysiology and it's, um, and so I hope we can uh, get them to join us in the future. Well, I love it. And I think role modeling is so important because when you can see what it looks like and we've had Andrea Russo, we've had Christine Albert and Jody Hurwitz is currently, you know, steering heart rhythm this year. I think it's wonderful to see that and to be able to say, well, I can identify because that's what an electrophysiologist looks like. And what an electrophysiologist looks like should look very different these days than the traditional if we want to make change. So I want to congratulate you. I hope that the best and the brightest come into EP, regardless of gender and sex. It's such a great field. Um, congratulations to you for choosing an awesome field and best of luck to you at UCSF and your fellowship. And I think this is a great, great moment for us to be able to see where we're at and then try to affect change from here. Thank you for joining us on Heart Rhythm TV, Stacey. Thank you so much.